so awesome. You may take your seats. Don't get too comfortable. I'm going to make you stand up for the reading of the word. You're like, man, I came to this church for this dedication, and they had us doing aerobics. <laughs> Such an exciting day uh, to be able uh, to just celebrate these amazing children. We have uh, started a series uh, this fall that we've entitled Generate Hope. Uh, Generate Hope is really just uh, the mission statement. Our call uh, by God, we feel as a community in this community. Last week, we talked about uh, a prayer. I mean, we talked about the presence of God and hope. And in that, we basically said this, right? Uh, presence plus hope equals what? New life. New life. This week, uh, we want to continue digging deep into who God has made us to be as we continue to unpack the values uh, that overflow is going to live into in this uh, new uh, future that God has given us. And I want to share about these really two important values, community and, and prayer. So I'm going to ask you to buckle up. Uh, we're going to dive in deep. Uh, you might want to jump off the train early. Stick with me. I promise I will land the plane in about six hours. No, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 21. So you know uh, what we do, Overflow. Would you stand up one more time for the reading of the word? And I'm going to read the scriptures. After I'm done, you, I will say, this is the word of the Lord. And you respond back to me saying, thanks be to God. And we'll pray and get into it. Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 11 through 21. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in, in, a fig in leaf, he went to find out if it had fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not in the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat the fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. One reaching Jerusalem, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches for those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written that my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? but you have made it into a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking at a way to kill him. For they feared him because he, the whole crowd was amazed at his teachings. When evening came, Jesus and the disciples went out to the city in the morning and they went along and they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, isn't that that fig tree? <laughs> Rabbi, look, he said, the free tree you cursed has withered. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these moments that we share. We pray, Father, that you would speak and that we would listen and turn words into action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> a tale is told about a small town that had historically been dry. But then a local businessman decided to build a tavern. A group of Christians from the local church were concerned and planned an all-night prayer meeting to ask God to intervene. It, it, so ha it just so happened that shortly after, the, after that, the lightning struck the bar and it burned down to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church, claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible but the church hired a lawyer to argue to the court that they were not responsible. 
the presiding judge, at, after his initial review of the case, stated that no matter how the case comes out, one thing is for sure. The owners of the tavern believe in prayer, and the Christians do not. <laughs> not too long after we accepted uh, the job here, and me, my wife, and my children moved from Buffalo, New York, uh, to uh, uh, Michigan, there were questions that were uh, pressed on me, it seemed like, every day. What is the vision of the church, right? And the connotation is this. Okay, you're the pastor. God has given you the word, so, so go up to your mountain top, right? Get, you hear the voice of God, right? Come back with glowing white hair and all that, and then lead us. <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not that overt, uh, but something to the effect uh, of it uh, came through. And my answer just was simply this. Hey, guys. We're just going to take time and figure out the culture here, right? We just want to start digging deep roots. Because here's the big question that we had to ask before we got to uh, our mission and our vision. What type of church do we want to become? Do do we want to be a church for, for all people, Do we want to become a missional church, a church that that was super deep and theological, but maybe not accessible to everyone? Uh, Do we want to become the type of church that is uh, super inviting, like a seeker-friendly church where we really don't talk about the Bible, but we talk about things like love and uh, daisies, and we skip through (laughs) the fields? (laughs) Do we, do we feel like we wanted to be a church that was a community center, maybe something akin to the Rotary Club? What type of church do we want to become? I, I want us to sit in that question and hold it in the back of your mind. See, we find Jesus entering into the temple just, just the, the day before he is, uh, he, he came in and it was a little bit late and he is, uh, Mark says that he just sat and he watched, looking around at everything that was taking place. The, the next day, uh, the disciples seem to have this different feel. Jesus seems to have this different feel. It feels like he's, he's on mission. He, he's got to, to get to the temple. And, and if you were one of his disciples, you probably thought, man, Jesus is having a, 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 like a, a bad day or something, right? Because he, he comes up, he sees a, a fig uh, tree, and it's got leaves, and it's green and, and lush. And then he goes to get like the fig tree, and then he curses at it. Like, come on, Jesus. Mark uh, says, it's not even fig season. Why would, you, why would you care about this fig tree? Why is Mark even putting this story in, in the book? It's not important. So then they just continue going, right? Uh, and the next event becomes even weirder. Uh, Jesus comes into the temple and then he starts uh, throwing people out. He starts uh, turning over the money t- changers' tables and, and, and turning over uh, driving people which are selling things. And then Mark makes this really weird, uh, uh, specific obser- observation. He turns over the doves. What is going on here? What is going on with Jesus? If I was a disciple with Jesus, I would have been asking. Like, this is supposed to be our triumphal entry. Like, this is the time. You're going to be king. You're going to be coronated as king of all. What is actually going on here? The story at first glance, if we have to be honest, is is really weird. So let's dive down and see what's taking place. When Jesus enters into the temple, what we have to understand that is he probably came into the court of the Gentiles. The only place in the whole complex where non-Jews were allowed to enter and worship. Suddenly, Jesus declares this for everyone within earshot, repeating the words of the prophet Isaiah. This is what he says. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. 
New Testament scholar David Garland writes, In Jesus' day, the temple had become a nationalistic symbol that served only to divide Israel from the other nations. If it were to become what God intended, a house of prayer for all nations, walls would have to crumble. Indeed, walls soon had to collapse and they had to be breached. See, unfortunately, it seems that the type of church that the children of Israel wanted to become in this place was was a type of church that was isolated and inwardly focused. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, which means that God did not plan for the temple to become a national shrine to Israel alone. God's promise of blessing is for all who would accept it. It is not excluded for those without Jewish uh, ethnicity, but it is God's salvation. It is God's plan for us. It is for the neighbor and the stranger, for the foreigner and the outcast, for the addict and the sick, for the orphan and those which are distant from God. They are invited to the promise of a future which is so great, which is so wonderful that the disciples had to stick by this Jesus character. They had had to drink from the cup that he wanted to give them. If, uh, If we are not careful, we can become like the children of Israel, can't we? We can become isolated and inwardly focused, still building segregated walls of politics and and money and denominations and ethnicity and and cultural walls, can't we? We have uh, created in the church, unfortunately, for so long an outcast system that decides who's in and who's, who's out. Who can enter into the presence of God? What type of church do we want to become? What type of church is it God inviting us into in this moment? As we, we say, God, you have, you have called us out on, on mission. Jesus' words here echo of the promise he had made to Abraham and his children that he would restore all people. Remember we talked about this last week, that he would restore all people through them, that the whole world would come to experience his presence. Yet here we see that the poor and the foreigner are excluded. There is a sad thing about all this is that we can get so caught up believing that we are living out the mission of God that we can justify our broken systems in the name of the Lord. And before we know it, God's community reflects our presence more than the presence of Jesus. And maybe, just just maybe, that's the reason when when people come in these places hurting, broken, uh, feeling down. They can't find peace in the place where God says there's supposed to be peace. What kind of church do we, do we want to become? Jesus here repeats Jeremiah's cry, and it, it rings hauntingly in the ears of that day, and it honestly should, should ring hauntingly in our ears. You have made my house into a den of robbers. Listen to Jeremiah's words in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 3 through 15. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your way and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury, burn incest to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? 
and then come and stand before me in the house which bears my name and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did, do, what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you didn't listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name. The temple you trust in, the place I gave to you, you and your ancestors, I will thrust you from my presence just as I did your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. We see Jesus echoing Jeremiah's words here. As God says that he is watching the temple and we see that what, what God is saying, I have seen your deeds and you have been found wanting. You have treated people poorly. This is not what my house was intended for. And, and, and we see Jesus living into that presence because Jesus being God in three person, the manifestation of his holiness right here. Mark eleven eleven. what does Jesus say? This is why Mark puts it in. Jesus saw the evil at the temple the day before. And maybe that's the reason why he's on the mission. Maybe that's the reason why he's frustrated. And he pronounces God's judgment. And he asks them and he asks us, what type of church will you become? Mark writes, in the morning, after all of the things that happened, uh, they went along and they saw a fig tree withered from roots. Peter, Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, take a look. The fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, now let me, let me uh, pause for a second to teach you a little bit of how to, to, to study scripture. Anytime you see anything repeated, take notice. See, this isn't just some, some weird little tree, and, and there's a reason that is sandwiched between uh, the story of the temple. Mark here is trying to drive home a point. So some of you which are like uh, environmentalists, you're like, man, the poor tree. <laughs> like, uh, that's not the point, right? <laughs> Garland writes, about this idea. He says that the fig tree incident brackets the temple's action and interprets it. It reveals more clearly that Jesus does not intend to cleanse the temple. Instead, his actions vis visually announce its disqualification. The fig tree that has not uh, born from fruit is cursed and not reformed or cleansed. As Jesus seeks fruit from the fig tree, so God, the owner of the vineyard, seeks fruit from the vineyard. When no fruit is to be found or when it is withered, withheld, destruction follows. God forbid. God forbid. Overflow church. That we ever become a church that looks like it's ripe and lavish, that has programs and a bunch of dedications and a bunch of things that, that look like it is full of fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. But when God, the owner of the vineyards, comes to the tree and he reaches for fruit, we are found fruitless. God forbid. Yeah. See, the problem with the Pharisees is that they were so focused on the temple that they didn't see that Jesus, the living presence of the temple, was in their midst and had taken place of the temple. Right. Jesus denounces their practices because Jesus did not simply help the individual poor people. He went to the very source of injustice and did something about it. Yeah, One scholar writes, and argues that Jesus attacks the sacrificial uh, tool system that, was com that compounded oppression to the poor. You, you see, in, in that day and time, uh, the sacrifice of doves was a sacrifice that only the poor can 
afford. And Jesus said, that time is over. You will not relegate the the marginalized and the disenfranchised to one end of the corner. And he upends these doves and he invites all to come freely and equally at the foot of the cross. Then Jesus answers a bewildered disciple, Peter, looking at Jesus. What's wrong with the fig tree, Jesus? Uh, It's not even... It's not even the season uh, for figs to be ripe. And he answers in the most amazing Jesus way. He doesn't answer the direct question. He answers it in a roundabout way. I love reading scripture because Jesus always throws you off guard. Okay, okay, all right, thank you, Jesus. This is what he says in verse 22. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to the mountain, go Throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they will say will happen and it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. What type of church do we want to become? See, see, the reason why uh, I can't answer it by going off into a mountain or, or, or you can't answer it or the elders can't answer it is because Jesus answered it. He answered the question of what type of church we'll become. This is his answer. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. It will be a house... Where, the, where every tribe, tongue, and nation, everyone on the social economic ladder gets to come freely and enjoy the presence of God. It will be a house forged by the power of prayer where we get to, to have the most, inter, the most intimate relationship with God. In Revelation, the Bible talks about uh, around the throne that the, that the elders of God day and night in prayer and adoration to God are saying holy, holy, holy. And the presence and the whole earth is filled with his glory. God invites us into that. This is the kind of church that God invites us to become. Jesus casts a vision of a day without a temple to the disciples where men and women, Jew and Gentile, have free access to the Savior. Jesus casts a vision where there will be no more need for a go-between to represent them before God so that they can go boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus calls us to tap into the power of prayer as we enter into his presence. To pray confidently and boldly and believe that God will be, will be down and in the muck of our lives. And it will extend to our neighbors' lives and to our community. Jesus expects us to pray that God will rip open the fabric of the natural and pour out the supernatural on us. Jesus expects us to pray confidently and boldly for forgiveness And know that we are not unclean because we have a great high priest who has sacrificed it all for us. And we have been hidden in him and have received his righteousness. Overflow Church. We live out these values of community and prayer by living out God's desire. What type of church? God called us to become. It rings out loud that his house will be called the house of prayer for all nations. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for all these moments that we have. I pray, Lord, that we would respond to your word, Jesus that we would be a church 
so overflowing with your presence that we would not exclude neighbor or stranger. We would not exclude those that may be broken, but we would enter into your love and grace and mercy, knowing that you have poured it upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us in this divisive world to be something different. Would you stand with me as I pray this blessing over your life, as we pray these blessings over our lives? In, a, in our new practice as a community, would you extend your hands in the posture of receiving and repeat these words after me? Father, transform us into an overflowing presence of your love in the world as we proclaim hope to the neighbor and the stranger. Manifest your kingdom here as it is in heaven. Amen.